Um, morning, everyone. Um, yes, the Internet of Useless Things. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, let me start with this. A couple of weeks ago, I was heading to Utrecht in the Netherlands for an innovation conference, and I thought I'd try an experiment. Can I get from my home in London to Utrecht using nothing but my Apple Watch? Um, so I kept my phone and my wallet in my bag. Um, I managed to do it. It was okay. It took a lot of effort at times. I had to do some clever downloading of QR codes, and they looked at me really weirdly on the train when I just stuck out my arm instead of giving a ticket. But it begs one big question, which is why? I could have happily done it without my watch. So I guess what this is all about is what is the point of this stuff? Fitness bands, these were very popular a couple of years ago. Uh, I think they were one of the big presents last year. So let's see here, who owns a fitness band? Stick up your hand if you've got a fitness band. Okay, reasonable number, I'm guessing close to half. Keep your hands up, um, put them down if you don't use it regularly. So only keep your hand up if you're still using it regularly. Okay, so we're seeing a disappearing number. In fact, I only see about a handful now. And this is the point. Um, fitness bands, it reminds me a bit of the, the kind of sandwich toaster, which is you have it for the first month, then you keep it in the cupboard. There was a study done in the States last year, and they found that 50% of fitness trackers are actually just left in the drawer. So there's one example of useless objects. Uh, let me give you my next example, possibly my favorite. If you own an iPod, iPhone, or digital video player, then you need TV Hat. Private, portable, and hands-free. TV Hat provides a motion picture experience absolutely anywhere. Call the number on your screen or visit us seenontvhat.com and order your TV Hat today. That will do us for now. But, yeah, so TV hat, apparently it is a thing. Um, so we have a big challenge with technology. And really the best way to understand the challenge we have, there's a lot of talk about the Internet of Things, so how we're going to join up everything from business to transport to our health to agriculture. But as humans, we struggle with this. This is from a guy called Larry Downs who, who came up with the laws of disruption. And if you can see at the top there, you've got technology. Technology, if you think of Moore's Law, Moore's Law is not a law, it's mostly a recommendation. But Moore's Law says technology, computing power is doubling about every 18 months. We're going a little bit faster than that right now. And it will keep doing that until you eventually get to kind of atomic level of computing. The problem is, as people, as humans, we don't really understand exponential. We understand things that are linear. And so we're always lagging behind. And then when you bring in business with the structures and the needs to actually manage things like profit, businesses are even slower at keeping up. And at the bottom here, you get governments. And if you think about governments, this is all about bureaucracy and administration. You just think about how governments legislate for technology, and they do it really, really badly, usually shutting the door after the horse has bolted um, and in a very draconian way. The other part of this exponential rise of technology is Bob Metcalf, who talked about he, the father of Ethernet. And he was saying, well, for every new person you get on a network, it actually creates an exponential value. So how do you close that gap? And the idea really is, is innovation. So innovation is not necessarily about new technologies. It's much more about understanding how you're going to apply those technologies in a useful and meaningful way. It's not simply about computing power. We've got all this stuff going on. So rapid prototyping. We've got new models for funding this kind of technology. And what it means is there's going to be a big change, which is that potentially all of our businesses, regardless of what we do, will actually be part of this new revolution. People are talking about Industry 4.0. This is a good example of something that I worked on. So this is, uh, it might sound useless, Fitbit for cats and dogs. Um, what it actually was, it came out some work we were doing with a pet food brand, which is that most dogs, particularly some cats, are overweight. And that's because we overfeed them. We think we, we replace love with food, essentially. So um, they didn't really want to go ahead with this as an idea. So myself and my colleague, we, we basically just built this thing. We ordered the innards of what was like a Fitbit from China for $10. 3D printed a case, made a video, put it on Indiegogo got enough funding to produce a prototype, and that's then enough to then take that to venture capital and actually try and build a business on it. And the point is, is that even if you are more of a service brand, you'll increasingly find that service brands are coming into product and that the internet things will actually impact on all of us. 
How big, we don't know. And here's a range of estimates as to the size. And you'll hear various people talking about these different things, but basically the lowest es estimate is about one-fifth of the highest. All we know is there's going to be a lot of stuff. And what this comes down to is one thing, which is there's a lot of hype. So I guess my first point is this, don't panic. Just because people are talking about the Internet of Things being on us, nobody really knows. It's great for my job as a futurologist because I can basically... Um, predict things without having to be proven right all of the time. But um, someone like Cisco obviously are talking a lot about IoT, and that's really key to what they do. So this is Gartner's hype cycle. Right at the top of the hype at the moment is the Internet of Things. Um, in the trough of disillusionment, we have things like virtual reality. So I guess my first point is just really think about how you're going to um, deploy this. The first thing to consider is what you've already got. Actually, connected devices are not new. We've had things like heart rate monitors, Bluetooth headsets, little televisions in the 80s on your watch. The thing that changed it all was the mobile phone, the smartphone, because suddenly that allows us to connect all of these objects in a meaningful way. So the mobile phone is now the core computing device, and that's where everything is coming from. But also think about the fact that just because everything's increasing exponentially, there actually has to be a lot of messing around before you get to the point where things um, actually get traction. So consider um, the computer mouse. So Bill Buxton from Microsoft talked about this. So computer mouse was a kind of little square block of wood in the 60s. And it wasn't until firstly Apple took Xerox's GUI um, and then eventually with uh, Microsoft that the mouse became ubiquitous. And we even got rid of that because then Apple then moved towards touch screens and again try finding a phone with buttons any longer. So there's often quite a long tail before you get into the innovation space. Example, TV hat, which is essentially a kind of fancy baseball hat with a screen in it, and then Oculus Rift, which is, remember, VR is at the, the trough of disillusionment. Oculus Rift, kind of useful if you're a gamer, but it really is a pair of ski goggles with something like a smartphone screen in it. Where it's going to get interesting is when we get things like um, the new version of Google Glass, which will be coming out soon, and um, things like um, um, Microsoft HoloLens and Sony Morpheus. And it's only then that we'll see that if we get enough uh, innovation that that traction will really begin to appear. But also, don't think we're at a point where technology is pretty ubiquitous. Everybody in this room has a smartphone. I don't even need to ask you that question. We've all got um, various computing devices, laptops, smart TVs. What's going to happen with the new generation is everybody's going to be different. So depending on who you are, what your interests are, what your personal needs are, and the same for business, will be your choice of devices. One of the challenges that you have to address, so really my second point here, is don't think about solutions, focus on the problem. I'll give you the best example of this. Um, this list here, this is basically, this is from a, a study of the things that, that worry people most in the UK. These are the biggest problems. Some of them admittedly are slightly first world problems. Um, running out of toilet roll. Yeah, I don't really stress about that, but things like sleep and work. And then compare that with something like the connected washing machine. I really dislike the connected washing machine. This is Samsung's one, and what it can do is to basically text you when the spin cycle has finished. So that doesn't really solve a problem in my life. It doesn't really make it any better. But then think about the real problem. The problem is that we actually have to wash our clothes. And interestingly, people like DuPont are working on fabrics and coatings for fabrics that will allow you to simply just shake the clothes and the dirt and the smell will drop out. So not only does that save the time in doing this, but it also saves a massive resource in things like electricity and water. The next thing is to think about, and you're going to hear a lot today about unified communications. And I think this is absolutely key to what is going on with the next generation, is understanding how you can connect people and things together in a meaningful way. Social media is one of those things that do it. We think of social media as a place for people, but actually it's rapidly becoming a place for things. You've got all kinds of stuff. Mars Curiosity uh, rover uh, tweets. We've got the tweeting kettle, uh, tweeting sculptures, and, and the cat selfie machine. This, this is actually one of my inventions. Um, it may sound useless, but it's actually very useful because what we're trying to do is to take this into cats' homes so that the cats can simply come up to the machine and basically promote themselves on Twitter for adoption. Um, and increasingly, yeah, so it's always cats with me, I think. Um, we're seeing the growth of, again, 
IoT operating system. And I think there's going to be a bit of a battle, something similar to what happened over mobile operating systems as well. But it's actually relatively easy right now to do simple connections. So Google have launched, and I had nothing to do with this name, their, their OS called Brillo. Um, I had uh, quite a field day on that. But there's simple tools like, uh, it's, called, it's called IFT, I-F-T-T-T-T. Um, such as series of recipes, some of you may know it because people use it for scheduling uh, social media posts, tweets, that kind of thing. But it actually do so much more. And if you look at it, you can connect across homes, you can connect, connect across Fitbits. And don't just think about it in terms of simply connecting devices and getting things working together. Suddenly, when you have this Internet of Things, it's able to produce a whole load of data that can be used in an interesting way. So... Um, one obvious example is someone like Uber. So Uber are using big data. They're using all kinds of information about traffic and weather and things like that to um, predict where cabs are going to be going next. And eventually they'll get to the point where the cab, you won't have to book a cab, it will pretty much be waiting for you as you want one. But you can use that data in far more interesting ways. One of the projects I'm working on is about using data to manage things like the spread of disease. So if you imagine the recent Ebola outbreak, um, you could actually see, because everyone, even in uh, countries like Sierra Leone, pretty much everyone has a mobile device of some sort. So if you simply track where those mobile devices have moved, you understand where the disease is going, and then you can simply set up shop there and start doing the, the, the um, vaccinations, or in the case of Ebola, you can do the um, isolations, and you can be far more effective. But it also works the other way around. If you think of what happened with Nepal, there was an earthquake earlier this year. And one of the things they said is, we don't know how many people are there. So if you could simply just track the data from the phones, so if you knew how many phones were in the area before the earthquake, and you know how many phones have since left that area, the number that you're left with basically tells you pretty much, to within a very small number of people, how many you're actually looking for. And that makes things like your... Um, Rescue service is much, much more effective. And don't think about just devices either. Uh, obviously, animals figure large in a lot of what I do. Um, we've had, we've already had the texting sheep, sheep that can basically, uh, I don't think they text like that, um, that basically they connect to their brains, and, and when a, a wolf is in the area, it's able to alert the shepherd to come and scare them away. But another really effective one, I know that Cisco's been involved in some of this, is connecting up cows. What you can do is put a small sensor on a cow's ear, and when it gets, its, its temperature gets to the right level, you know it's ready for insemination, and again, it will send a message to the farmer to come out and do the, the inseminating. What the result of that is, is this, um, calf production increases sixfold. Now, in an era of scarce resources, that is a really useful thing to be able to manage. And then we have the growth of artificial intelligence. And what's increasingly happening is there's already quite a bit of AI in our lives. Um, probably for the same trip to Utrecht, I was going to the airport and I was just checking what the time would be to the airport. This was a couple of days before. And it knew from my emails that I wanted to catch that particular fight. So Google Maps is telling me pretty much what time I have to leave on that day based on what they already know about me. Or now when I get a call on my iPhone, again, based on the kind of messaging uh, that I've been doing, it will guess as to who they think it's calling me, even if they're not part of my contacts. And it's filtering through a lot of what we do. So we think of computers as being able to do repetitive tasks. But what we're now seeing is the ability of computing to do much more analytical work. So uh, we're already seeing um, things like uh, some city reports written by artificial intelligence. Law reports are beginning to be written by computers. There are no humans along the way. But the other area that's having an impact, which I think is something that will affect all of you, is things around customer experience. So increasingly what will happen is one of our, one of our top list of problems was the um, um, contact centers, call centers. Um, was uh, increasingly when customers ring up, artificial intelligence will be able to fill that call immediately. They'll be able to connect that phone number to a previous activity, maybe something you did online, a complaint that you, and put you straight through. So AI, there's, you know, all this stuff is a double-edged sword. People are kind of worried about the machines taking over the world. Well, arguably Google already is Skynet. But um, on the whole, at the moment, it's going to make us work a lot smarter. 
Because the next point really is about what I call the service layer. So first off, you've connected your devices in a meaningful way. You're using all that data. But then you need to think about what actually sits on top of that. And the best way to talk about the service layer is very much to think about what's happened with apps. So we used to, the early, early smartphones, we used to download the apps and marvel that you could basically make fart noises and um, pop bubble wrap and that kind of thing. And we've gone way beyond that now. And we don't think simply about how clever and new it is, but simply how it connects things together. So Uber is a great example. Biggest taxi company in the world, doesn't own a single car. Airbnb, same kind of thing. Um, they book more hotel rooms than the Hilton Group, uh, but obviously they don't own a single property. But it kind of covers everything. Obviously, you've got um, the Uber for people. It's called Tinder. Um, Tinder is interesting uh, because uh, what it's actually doing is causing the death of the nightclub. People are going to nightclubs less and less because they're able to connect through that. Um, I put in things like Ift, and then you've got Depop, which is a really simple application that just allows you to take a photograph of your clothes and just sell them uh, um, through PayPal. It's kind of like Instagram, but with a bit of eBay thrown in. And the key point is, is that what you need to be thinking about as a business is not simply just producing an app, but actually thinking about how that's going to deliver uh, a, a more useful, a more beneficial service. Tesla is definitely a company that gets the IT. You would expect that. But I think there's, there's a really interesting uh, um, example with them. So every Tesla car comes with 4G built in. Um, and they had a problem with their, um, uh, with, with their, with their system. Uh, and they were able to do an over-the-air update to the car management system. That was done quietly, no fuss, no recalls. Now, you only have to look at VW right now and what's going on there. I saw yesterday they said they won't even start doing the updates until September. And a lot of these problems with VW, I know, is connected with software. Some of it, there is a, 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 a mechanical issue. But if only they'd been Tesla, life would have been so much simpler for them. But then if you want to think about, and again, this is, you know, this is one way of unifying communications, Disney Magic Band. I don't know if anybody's been to a Disney theme park. This is a one billion investment. There's a lot of money behind it. But it's amazing the way it's kind of unified it all into this frictionless experience. So the Magic Band, um, it's like the uh, fitness bands you, keep, you don't wear any longer. And that arrives uh, in a nice little box with your name on it before you go to the park. And you can use it to get on the bus, you obviously book yourself into the rides. What it means is you can actually go on rides without um, uh, having to wait in a queue because it's all pre-booked and pre-timed. Really nice bit of user experience there, which is a little Mickey Mouse head on the band, and you just connect the two together to touch in. When you go into the restaurants, you can just simply order off the menu using the band. And because they know who you are, they just bring the meal straight to your table, and when you're done, you leave. You don't have to get your credit card out because you've registered it to that. And I think that's about how you can create that kind of complete unified experience. Um, but even then, I think what's happening, the way it's working, is that um, the way we think about objects, the way we're going to use them is going to change. This is actually an art project, but I, I just think it's a really fascinating example of how things will likely change. This is Brad the toaster. So Brad is one of many toasters. He's a connected toaster, which... You know, sounds a little bit like the kind of pointless connected washing machine. But the thing about Brad is he likes to be used. So if you don't use him, he simply puts himself up for sale on eBay and goes to a home who wants it. But it's a really interesting question because actually there's a lot of overconsumption of products. Brad the toasters, uh, sandwich makers being another, another great example of that. Um, and maybe cars, perhaps. One of the things that we're beginning to notice is once you get self-driving cars that can keep moving all the time, the idea that you'd have a car that's essentially parked up 80, 90% of the time seems utterly ridiculous and wasteful. So what will probably happen is we'll actually have a lot more car sharing, and with AI, the car will just appear because it will know that you need that car, and you just get in it, and it will take you to your destination. Driving will basically become a hobby, a bit like horse riding or sailing. If you think the horse was a means of transport, some years ago. So this idea of kind of ownership of so much stuff, and this is going to cut across businesses as well. So it's going to be much more of a kind of least collaborative model um, for products in the future.
are born to live their lives. I'm born to dance. Want me to work like a dog in a full-time job? Ha <laughs> ha, I'm born to dance. Don't wear no coat, no tie, no shirt, and even no pants. I'm born to dance. You shaking your head? Well, I'll be shaking my ass, cause I'm born to dance. I wanna shake it and shake it and shake it, shake it and shake it, girl. Do you wanna shake it? I wanna shake it and shake it and shake it, shake it and shake it, yo. Watch me dance now. So I thought that was uh, interesting to show. In fact, we were having a uh, conversation earlier about how relevant this is. This, this is unified communications, in a way. And what's really key, why I like this, is essentially a, a, an advert for smart cards, is that it's solving a problem, but it's doing it in a brilliant and engaging way. And it's showing how, as a business, you can connect across all kinds of different um, devices and um, different kind of fields of people's lives. Um, this is an idea. So one of the problems with technology is we tend to... So technology is not the solution. Technology is just the medium. Innovation is what becomes the solution. And the problem with technology is we have this habit of... It's what I call kind of everything in the kitchen sink. We tend to throw it all in there. This guy, David Rose, who's working at MIT, is trying to take a different approach to it. He talks about the one-pixel interface. And the idea is simply this, is that actually objects... Well, what we need is very simple objects that connect... connect to do just simple tasks. So he mentions things like the medicine bottle, that the cap just chirps when it's time to take your medicine. Or in this case, the umbrella, as you want to make this. Uh, this is an umbrella, uh, it's, it's a concept, um, and the, it basically looks at the weather forecasts. And when it's raining, the handle or the tip glow to just remind you to take it with. And I think sometimes there is a tendency that we tend to overcomplicate stuff. So I guess if I was to sum all of this up, um, the solutions come from really quite simple things and just stripping it back, trying to avoid the hype and think about how you're going to connect what you've already got, unifying communications. What are you going to deliver as a service layer? And then focus on the problems. What are the real challenges for you as a business? What are the real challenges for your clients? And once you've done that, you can then think about creating a highly engaging experience. And I guess, well, let me bring it back to this one, TV hat. Um, I guess the problem with the, all of these useless things is that there's always some idiot out there who is stupid enough to buy it. So I give you TV hat. It really is a thing. I think I'm going to put it on as well. Thank you very much.